right, well, it's great to be with you this morning. And uh, Christmas has long been recognized as a time to think about peace. Uh, the angelic uh, declaration that first Christmas night, I mean, think about it. The angels appeared to the shepherds on the hillside. Uh, I guess the shepherds were in the hillside, not the angels were on the hillside, but the shepherds, or the angels are in the sky, but the angels appear, and uh, they say to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace. A fitting declaration for the one, as we've heard read already this morning, who Isaiah told some 700 years before Christ came, that this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, would one day come. And from that time forward, the topic of peace and Christmas have gone hand in hand. Uh, consider this true story from World War I. Have to stay there. World War One. No, WW One. Uh, amid the horrors of World War One, there occurred a unique truce where, for a few hours, enemies behaved like brothers. The time was Christmas Eve, 1914, and all was quiet in France on, on France's Western Front, from the English Channel to the Swiss Alps. Trenches came within 50 miles of Paris. The war was only five months old, and approximately 800,000 men had been wounded or killed already. Every soldier wondered whether Christmas Day would bring another round of fighting and killing. But that Christmas Day, that first Christmas Day of World War I, something unusual happened. Uh, British soldiers raised Merry Christmas signs and soon carols, Christmas carols were heard coming from the British trenches and from the German trenches alike. And Christmas dawned with unarmed soldiers uh, leaving their trenches as, as officers of both sides wondered what was going on. Uh, and and the, the soldiers met in the middle in the no man's land and they uh, they exchanged songs and conversation small gifts mostly sweets and cigars and they passed Christmas Day peacefully on that war front and in fact at one spot the British soldiers played soccer with the Germans who won three to two and in some places a spontaneous truce con uh, continued into the next day neither side being willing to fire the first shot and eventually, uh, of course, replacements came along and both armies were ordered that such informal uh, understandings with the enemy would be punished by treason, as treason. And the war continued. But what a remarkable demonstration of Christmas and peace and how mm. Christmas Day brought peace right there in the middle of literally a combat zone, uh, bringing uh, different languages and different people together. And while maybe not quite peace on earth, uh, that... Uh, in 1914, at least there was peace in the trenches of Europe that day. Um, pretty remarkable, I think. But if Christ is really the Prince of Peace, why is there so little peace in the, in the world today? I mean, surely you would think we all want peace, don't we? I mean, which one of us doesn't want peace? And yet, in our world, despite all the peace summits and dialogues and nation building and goodwill, ours is a world that is seemingly restless and on the brink of conflict, isn't it? We can uh, sometimes feel the tension. We hear it in the news. Uh, we who serve in the military, we know it. We hear it talked about from the chain of command. And whether it's in our personal lives or different factions in our own country or maybe even the international stage, we live in a peaceless time, don't we? We really do. We live in a peaceless time uh, by and large. The truth of the matter is we as, as mankind, we love to talk about peace, but we really don't seem to have much of it or at least to be able to grasp it for very long. I, I would say that's pretty accurate. And as, as if all those questions are not disconcerting enough, Jesus' own words cause us to question, is peace really possible? Consider what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Jesus said, Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. What? What are you talking about? I thought this was supposed to be a peace message. And, and, and what, what was Jesus meaning there? How can we reconcile those words with the prophecy that Christ would be the Prince of Peace? And where does that leave us in our own individual quest for peace? Can we really hope to have peace in this life? I mean, how could the angels declare that night that peace on earth. 
mean, was there peace on earth? Did all war stop? Had, had all fighting stop? No, certainly not. You know, maybe our idea of peace is wrong altogether. Maybe it's an impossible goal. Maybe we're just asking for too much. In light of all this, I think we would certainly would do well to understand what God really says about this matter of peace, particularly during our Christmas season. I mean, is peace really possible? The Bible has a lot to say about this subject. In fact, the word peace is used some 429 times in our Bible. That's a lot, 429 times. But before we can ever hope to have peace in the international realm, or even in our interpersonal relationships, we must first have peace within. Peace within. And everybody, it seems like, it seems to be searching for inner peace these days, right? I mean, inner peace, we talk of mindfulness and, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And multitudes of our day look to Eastern religions and, and sometimes the practice of Buddhist monks or, or the idea of enlightenment or, or mindfulness or all these kinds of things. And, and certainly we should take time to reflect and think about inner peace, all that. that there, there's some importance there. But biblically speaking, when we talk about inner peace, we kind of hit a brick wall. We have a big problem, a really big problem. While we can strive to calm our inner being and whether we feel that calm there or not, we as humans have a significant hurdle, and that is this. We are naturally the enemies of God because by, by practice and by nature, we are sinners. We have broken God's law. We've gone against his commands. And so, yeah, a person can look within themselves and maybe experience a measure of, uh, of temporary peace, but if we listen closely enough, we will hear his voice warning us, calling us, drawing us, telling us that peace within ourselves, peace by ourselves, is not enough. In fact, it's only lasting and superficial. What our hearts really cry out for is peace with God. Our hearts are restless till we find our peace in thee, or till we find our rest in thee, if you will. And so this brings us our text to today, uh, John chapter 14, uh, definitely not a Christmas passage, but definitely a passage that involves Peace. In John 14, John, uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, and just celebrating communion. The same night that that first Lord's table took place is the same night that we find the words of our text that Jesus spoke. Uh, and so John chapter 14, verse 27, our text for today, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What did Christ want his disciples to understand? As he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Well, I think the first thing we need to realize right away, I mean, this is exactly what Christ is saying. Christ came to give you peace. Have you ever thought about that? Christ came to give you peace. And when you have, it, have his peace, you experience peace with God. We've already heard about that. Peace with God comes by becoming a child of God. It comes by embracing Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, Romans 5.1 has already been read this morning. Thank you, family, who, who light our candle, lit our candle, whatever the right uh, verb tense is there, whatever, and, and the verses and the testimony. Yes, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to ask you this morning, have you made peace with God has the hatred, the enmity between you and God been removed? Do you personally have peace with God? Last weekend, I was talking to uh, an elderly saint who, who actually his wife at this moment is in stage four cancer. And uh, he was telling me uh, prior, prior uh, to retiring, he was a government contractor. And at one point in their life, a, a military helicopter had just crashed like a week before. And they were set to get... Uh, take a helicopter flight on the same kind of helicopter. And all those fellow contractors are like, I'm not getting on that thing. I'm not getting on that thing. You know, you know, I can relate and ask him, are you willing to get on this uh, helicopter? He's like, I've made my peace with God. If, if it's my time, I'm ready. And, and this man, he, he went on to say, as long as he worked with those co-workers, that's how he was known. Oh yeah, that guy, oh yeah, he's good to go. He's got peace with God. That's how, that was uh, how his co-workers knew him, that he had made Peace with God. And if you ever hope to have real peace in life, it must begin by peace with God. And this is how it, how it starts. You can have peace with God because of Christ. Peace comes in the form of a person. 
Peace comes in the form of a person. It comes in Christ. So I ask you, have you made peace with God? When was the point in time in your life when the transaction was made, your sin was forgiven, and you became a child of God? The wall of hostility, as Ephesians tells us, was broken down, moved. There's peace with God. But having peace with God is only the beginning. You thought, hey, we're done with the sermon, right? Uh, peace with God is only the beginning. The Prince of Peace came to bring peace between God and a person, but that is just the start. You see, once we have peace with God, it makes experiencing the peace of God possible. The peace of God. Have you ever considered uh, the title that Jesus used in the Old Testament? We heard it, heard it read, the Prince of Peace. Literally in the Hebrew, Sar Shalom. You recognize that word Shalom? If you're in a Jewish context, that's the way they say hello, right? Shalom, Shalom. Well, what does that mean, Shalom? Or, or even in the Arabic context, Salem. Hey, the same word, just a different language, right? Salem, Shalom, peace. Maybe, maybe our idea, sometimes we think of peace as like this absence of war, absence of conflict. But would that really make a lot of sense if you, if you went up to somebody today or you're, you're greeting one another and, hey, I hope you don't have any conflict today. I hope you don't have any wars today. It has to mean something more than that. And when we think about peace, when we think about why even today, and, and back then and even today, that, that's used in a greeting in certain cultures. It means more than just the absence of conflict. In fact, the idea has this, this, uh, this thought of wholeness or completeness. See, real peace is not just not having any battles, but having completeness, wholeness, fullness. And that's that sense. And in, in John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. And he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. He was not saying, hey, you're not going to have any battles. Because there were some battles about to come, right? There was some persecution about to come. That's not what Jesus was saying. What Jesus is saying is, I am giving you everything you need. I am giving you wholeness and completeness. And although I am about to be physically gone, I am giving you everything you need uh, to live for me. And Jesus is speaking on the night that he was uh, betrayed. And he's saying, I'm giving you everything you need. I'm giving you his peace. And we, we skip verse 26, but let's go back and look at exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Jesus is saying, this peace that you're going to have, this wholeness, this completeness, this ability to live for God, and, and even in persecution and, and distress, this peace comes in the form of the Holy Spirit. It comes in the form of the Holy Spirit. And so having peace with God uh, makes the peace of God possible. When we trust Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus is telling his disciples this. He says it later in John 16, These things have I spoken, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Christ is telling us that peace, the peace of God is not the absence of difficulty, but it is God's peace, God's peace present even in difficulty. Amen. A peace that can exist through every problem of life. Every problem. A peace that can exist and, and not just like hang on, but literally blossom, literally, literally bloom. A peace that survives persecution and, and the difficulties of life. Well, if there's going to be a peace that survives persecution and difficulties and all the problems, well, that kind of has to be an out of this world peace, doesn't it? Because that's not a natural peace. I mean, the, I, I get peace when things are good, but then problems start happening, and I get kind of, you know, in turmoil. But Jesus is saying, this peace that I give you, it, it, it goes beyond the circumstances. It exceeds the bounds of logic. It is a peace that passes all understanding. And this is the kind of peace that Jesus comes to offer us. It's not a peace that, hey, everything's going all right. Oh, what a pretty scene but a peace that passes our, our, all understanding. And the story is told of uh, two painters who were tasked with uh, creating art that represented the concept of peace. Now, you don't want to see my art. If I were drawing art, you'd see a bunch of stick figures on there. That's about as good as it gets for me. But the, these two artists were uh, uh, drawing pictures of peace, their concept of peace. And the first artist drew this wonderful scene. Uh, make sure I, I say this right. It was a beautiful evening foreground. There was a lake. 
a surface, uh, absolutely calm, unruffled, trees surrounding it, meadows stretched out into the distance, all this kind, all this beautiful scenery, the setting sun, all spoke of perfect rest. As I read the description, it kind of remind, reminds me of maybe a Thomas Kincaid. Do you remember when that was a thing? Those of you that have been around long enough, everybody wanted a Thomas Kincaid painting. That was a thing, you know? Oh, so peaceful, so calm. You know, now you see like our kids are like, who's Thomas Kincaid? Whatever. Uh, but that was the thing, you know, the peaceful painting. Uh, that was the first concept of uh, peace there. But the second painter drew something different. He drew a wild, stormy scene. Heavy black clouds hung overhead. In the center of the picture was a, an immense waterfall pouring forth huge volumes of water and the foam, and you can, you can sense the churn. And yet, if you look closely enough at that picture, you could see there, just beside the waterfall, was a bird perched in the cleft of the rock. And despite all the storm and all the turmoil, that bird had its beak open, singing its song. All the turmoil all, all around, but that bird had peace. It was in a safe place. Danger all around, but it was perched in a safe place. Peace that passes understanding. A peace that is there despite the outward circumstances. This is the kind of peace that God calls us to. To have peace with God and then to have His peace that passes all circumstances. I was reading uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, on uh, some early church history. I'm really nerding out, you know? And I was reading about this guy named Polycarp. One, I think that's a, kind of a strange name, Polycarp. I mean, you might name your kids Polycarp, I think. Uh, but uh, Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the early church fathers. And by the way, his name literally means much fruit. So, uh, okay, that's a, a decent me meaning there. But uh, excuse me, he was mission of Smyrna and he died in 8156. And uh, he was brought before the tribunal just before he died in the crowd, and it was, it was a time when uh, they were putting people to death for being Christian. And of course, he had, a, he, uh, had been a pastor, or a bishop, if you will, and uh, he was brought before the council, and the, and the leader begged him. He said, consider yourself and have pity on your great age. Polycarp was an elderly man by this time. Uh, Reproach Christ, and I will release you, the leader said. Polycarp replied, 86 years I have served him. He has never once wronged me. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. He was threatened with wild beasts and fire, yet Polycarp stood his ground. And on his farewell, as he died, he said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of the martyrs mm. I may share I submit to you that that is a man who knew the peace of God that passes understanding. Amen. And though in that moment all the counsel and maybe it felt like the weight of the world was against him, he said, I will not renounce Christ. He is my peace. He has given me peace with God. And I have the peace of God in this circumstance, even in this, this dramatic circumstance. He knew the peace of God in his life. So having peace with God makes the peace of God possible. And according to John 14, God's peace comes in the form of a person. So it really turns out that this adage is true. I don't know if you've heard this before, but I like it. Know Jesus, know peace. But to know Jesus is to know peace. Amen. So the first one, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have any real peace. Know Jesus, know peace. But to know Jesus is to know peace. And the truth of the matter is, the degree that God has you, or the degree that you know Jesus, is the degree that you know peace. I mean, think about this. If, if Jesus has a little part of your life, well, then you'll experience a little bit of his peace. And if Jesus has some of your life, well, then you'll have partial peace. But if you give all of your life to Jesus and you say, Lord, I am yours. I want your peace. I want to follow your direction for my life wholeheartedly. Well, then you have all of his peace. And so the degree that you know him, he already knows all about you, but the degree that you know him, and follow him is, is the degree of peace you will have, a peace overflowing. And there's one more aspect that we must consider this peace quickly as we think about this. Once you know that you have peace with God, and once you know the peace of God in you, and you have God's peace that no matter what's going on around you, you can say, I have the peace of God because God is in me. I have the Holy Spirit. Once you know those things, God, Christ, calls you to be a peacemaker. Remember that Sermon on the Mount, the first 
sermon that we have recorded in the scriptures, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus tells, uh, tells those in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We are to be peacemakers for God. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a peacemaker for God? Well, it certainly does mean doing our best to be kind and gracious and loving and forgiving and long-suffering. I've worked all that stuff. You know, and we're in the mall parking lot, and I've got the perfect parking spot. Somebody's pulling out, and I think they got it, and then somebody else pulls right in. Oof, i got to work on peace. You know, i got to work on being a peacemaker. Uh, but maybe you can relate. Uh, you know, Paul tells us, live as much as is possible, live peaceably with all people. And Paul told Timothy, he said, strive to live a peaceful life peaceful life. We can look at other passages. James says the, the, the um, wisdom of God works peaceful fruit of righteousness. If you claim to have the peace of God in your life, then you and I must examine, is there anyone with whom we are at odds? Is there anyone with whom that we do not have peace? And you're like, oh, that's tough stuff. Because, you know what, there are some people that I just find it tough to get along with. Maybe it's that family member who you refuse to speak to, or that former acquaintance that you vowed to never contact again, or that broken relationship that you've long since quit caring about. If having the peace of God means anything at all, why certainly it means living out a life of peace, living out the life of God's peace in our relationships. Is there a relationship or a former relationship in your life where the Holy Spirit of God is calling you to demonstrate the peace of God, to be a peacemaker. It must be his peace through you, because if you try it on your own, you'll lose it, right? Uh, I've been there and, and there sometimes. We need God's peace through us. And certainly Christ recognizes that as we try to be peacemakers, there are some people who will never respond. Some people will never uh, return that peace. And uh, Jesus told that. We're, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. The next thing Jesus says is, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. There, there are some people that you're going to try to make peace with, and they're never going to receive it. In fact, they're going to return evil for your good. Not everyone will embrace God's peace, even when we seek to be peacemakers. But Christ still calls us to be peacemakers. He calls you to be a peacemaker for Jesus. Having that peace with God. Having the peace of God in your life. And then being a peacemaker for Him. So this Christmas, as we consider the topic of peace, let us recognize the Prince of Peace has come. The only one who could ever make it possible for us to have peace with God. And the angels were exactly right that first Christmas night. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. It wasn't that peace covered the globe. It was that peace was on earth that night. Peace in that manger. Peace incarnate had come to earth. Do you know the Prince of Peace? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. Thank you that you came to give us your peace. Lord, in our world today, whether it's internally or in our relationships or globally, we need your peace. And Lord, we can never find real peace apart from you. Lord, I pray today, if there's someone who does not know your peace, does not have peace with you, or maybe uh, does not have that peace of God in you, that are in them, Lord, I pray that you would work in their hearts. Help them, help us to have the peace that you want us to be. And then, Lord, I pray that we would be wise enough to listen to your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, as you bring names and faces and relationships to our mind, people that we need to reach out to, be a peacemaker to you and help us to live out the peace of God because, Lord, that's who you call us to be. Lord, it is only possible as we seek to serve you. Lord, I pray that you help us to be people of peace, serving the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to recite with